And now, Mystery Theater. Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Welcome to the world of terrifying imagination. The fear you can hear. No breath of it yet as we begin our tale and meet Stephen and Simon Fairley. The occasion is solemn, as death should be. But all else for these identical twins is a wild sense of freedom and expectation with no hint of the dark disasters already forming as they listen to the words of their father's last bequests. And that the whole of my estate shall be disposed of as follows. To Stephen Fairley, my firstborn son, I leave all my worldly goods in entirety. Well, thanks a hunk for nothing, dear old dad. Uh, there, there is a clause that refers to you, Simon. Then let's hear it. To my second-born, Simon, I leave only advice. Mend your ways. It is inconceivable to me and has been most of my life that you could be brother to Stephen, much less his identical twin. Now, that's enough, Mr. Holcomb. Well, there are some small bequests. Uh, no, we can take them up later. Uh, I'm, I'm really sorry, sir. Well, so am I, Stephen. I never expected the old crook to outfox me. I hope he rots in hell. That's a damnable thing to say. Precisely. Since this family long ago decided I'm the devil's own, why shouldn't I be his advocate? Or apostate? To hell with us all, Stephen. And may I be the last to join you. Our mystery drama, And Death Makes Even Stephen was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Michael Tolan and Paul Hecht. It was true of the Fairley twins. Physically, no one could ever tell them apart. But their personalities, that was something else again. Stephen, the quiet, the considerate, the steady, the accountable. Simon, the wild, the unpredictable, the often cruel, the man of success in nothing. Except for physical resemblance, these two men from the same mother seemed the antithesis of each other. Aren't you going a bit heavy on that, Simon? Oh, just getting all I can, brother dear, while the getting is good. Now that I'm a pauper, I must make the most of every opportunity. Don't be a fool. Here, give me that. Oh, such a waste. But then you can afford it. You've had enough today. Besides, I must talk to you. Oh, you mean there may be a chance that I am not to be cast out and told never to darken the door again? Knock it off, Simon. I got to talk to you, seriously. And for Pete's sake, sit down. No, I think I prefer to face the coup de grace, standing back to the wall, unblindfolded and unafraid. Suit yourself, but quit clowning and stay away from the booze. Okay, okay, Stevie, forgive me. It was just Dad's will. I know he didn't exactly approve of me, but wow. (laughs) Finding out how much really threw me for a loop. It isn't as bad as it seems. There was a letter to me. He didn't want to leave you with nothing, Simon. And he's asked me to set up a trust. To be administered by me to provide you with a decent income. Well, now I think I, I will sit down. How much? The trust. Or the income? No, the money in the pocket, my one-hour older brother. That's what I get while you're alive, right? Yes, a thousand a month, (laughs) tax-free. Twelve thousand shimmering simoleons a year. (laughs) That's a generous bequest from a man who could have bought Rhode Island and still have had enough left over to cut the national debt in half. What would you have expected him to do? What he should have done, considering who we are. What? Cut the estate right down the middle. Left us each a half. You know why he'd never have done that. Oh, yes, only too damn well. I was ten before I was old enough to latch on to the truth. Why, you were always the favorite. No, no, favorite isn't even the word. 
You know he always blamed me for Mother's death. He hated me. That isn't true. Then why do the you suppose... The shoe was somehow on the other foot. Your whole life, Cy. Expelled from school after school, the girls, the car accidents, robberies, beating up women, all the things he had to cover yes, for you. Yes, to save the precious fairly name. All the things I did to get his attention. To have him treat me like a human being instead of a murderer. Yeah, you've been drinking too much. Oh, no, Stevie boy. This is Simon Cold Sober. Simple Simon, who couldn't have his only parents' love, so he didn't know any better thing to do than to reach out any way to get him to even notice we me. We spent most of our lives in boarding schools. Do you think he offered me so much Yeah, more? only the whole ball of wax. I was talking of love. That's a word with no meaning in this house. Even between us. What do we really know about each other? Except as children, we've been separated most of the time. And I always managed to get the short end. <laughs> Who was drafted while you and Dad lived at home and you joined the business while I crawled on my belly with the VC trying to do what my father didn't have the nerve to do? Get rid of me. None of that was my fault. No. But Becky was something else again. You were missing in action. Reported killed. It was over two years, Cy. I loved Becky, too, and she turned to me. Yeah, too bad I returned before the marriage had taken place. <laughs> Still, in my condition, then, it was hard to think of us as identical twins. Forty pounds difference in weight made quite a difference, huh? So she stuck with you, and you won, as always. Which brings us back to the immediate problem. Are you ready to cut the estate right down the middle and give me half? <laughs> Don't be ridiculous. But you are the brother who is all love. The money isn't dollars and cents, Simon. It's the shipping business, the holding company, the import-export exchange, a hundred interlocking parts. All right, then buy me off. A million, a couple of million, <laughs> out of those nice, anonymous, numbered Swiss bank accounts. And then you can do what my father longed his whole life to do. Forget I ever existed. Or that I still do. No way. Now, in three to five years, you'd blow it all on women and every grifter who got next to you with his get-rich-quick scheme. No. Father was right. I may have found him hard to love. Oh, you worked but... hard enough to toady your way into his affections. Perhaps I was... Perhaps I was sorry for him. Now, who is to say which of us caused Mother most harm, caused her to die in childbirth? Ah, past history. Oh, now there are only two of us. Now, come on, Cy, won't you accept Dad's suggestion and mourn him in some decency? 12000 a year? I can't live on that. It's free and clear. You have the house to live in, food, no living expenses. All right, suppose... Suppose I accept. We'll make it all legal. The trust can revert to you, if you will, by your 35th birthday. And Becky? She's already made her choice. But, but what? Well, since your unexpected return and father's death have delayed our marriage, well, perhaps it's only fair. Look, there's no way I can prevent you seeing her again, and now that you're back to yourself physically, I suppose you ought to. You know our engagement party is a week from tomorrow, but she won't be back from New York till then. In spite of father's death, we've decided not to call it off. You're invited. And if you think you can replace me as the prospective groom, <laughs> what can I do to prevent you? But as far as Becky is concerned, if you hurt her in any way, twin brother or not, I'll kill you. Well, now I must see about the funeral arrangements. Huh. Not you, dear brother. I. I'm the one with everything to gain. If only I knew the way. Steve, why are you so late? Uh, would you believe a flat tire tonight of all nights? And, oh, and Becky, well, it, it, it doesn't matter now, now that you're here. But you've got to help me, darling. We're, we're going to have to make a decision. About what? Kiss me first. I don't need any invitation for that. like that before. There's never been an occasion quite like this. Well, it, it looks as though it isn't going to be the occasion we planned it to be. What does that mean? It's father. You know how uptight he can get over nothing. Nobody better. I grew up with one of my own. 
I never heard you talk like that about your father before. Oh, I just... I just meant the generation gap. Well, maybe that that's what it is with father. He's, he's just laid it out flat. No engagement tonight, no announcement, nothing. Then what's the party supposed to be for? It isn't even a party anymore. It's a sort of memorial service for his old friend. He said it would be an insult to just his memory to have gaiety and fun so soon after his funeral. But I want us to be engaged. I don't want to wait. Look, I have, I have an even better idea. What? Let's you and me slip out right now. Forget the engagement and get married. But uh, how? We have no license or... Look, we're less than 20 miles from a state where all we need is the fee and two witnesses. Oh, oh you, you really bowl me over, Stephen. That's more the kind of thing Simon would do. Well, Simon was a bit of a whack, I guess. Simon was a lot worse than that. There are things I could tell you about your brother that... Well, that's past history. How is he now? The very picture of health. It's unbelievable. When he got back from prison camp, I... I could hardly recognize him. He'd had a rough time. I know. And that's why I was so ashamed of myself for... For what? Don't... Don't tell this to anyone, Steve. But I... I always used to be so scared after... After Simon and I had broken off and it was you and me. Scared of what? Just hold me. <sighs> you were... You're so uncannily alike. Even I, who know you both so well, was scared I, I might not be able to tell the difference. Oh, darling, what a terrible thing to have to say or even think. Don't think it. Put it out of your thoughts. I can't. It's eerie. It's terrifying to even consider I could ever mistake my kind, gentle, loving Stephen for that wild, brutal twin who would have destroyed us. Shh, darling. Don't look back. Kiss me, and then let's take off together. Oh, Steve, I can't. With, not with the gift. Then kiss here. me. No, not, not with I the... Said, kiss <laughs> me. Damn. You... You're not Stephen? Stephen would never... Stephen. I've been looking for you everywhere, Becky. Oh, I wish you'd found me sooner. What's going on here? Well, it, it doesn't matter now, now that you're here. Seeing you together, there's, there's no doubt but a pilot. What is it? Look, if that lousy no, brother of Stephen, mine... don't be silly. He, he was just congratulating me. That's a little enthusiastic for just an engagement, wasn't it? I haven't told you the news yet, Stephen. It isn't our engagement we're announcing tonight. What? It's our wedding, and as soon as possible, unless you object. Oh, of, of course not, but your father... Uh, you leave him to me. I'll arrange everything. Oh, you lead, I'll follow. When's the day? Just as fast as we can get the license. Like, day after tomorrow, or the one after that at the latest. <laughs> I wish you didn't have to go, Steve. We should have been the party tail enders. I gotta get Simon home. He's practically out cold. Yeah. Come on, Simon. Uh, Come on, get in. Yeah, no, no. The driver's seat. You're in no condition to drive. Well, you're a lousy driver. I'm better at the wheel than you, drunk or sober. Now, would you get in the car? Uh, yeah. He's out cold. I hope someone's up to help lug him up to bed. Well, good night, darling. Good night. Drive carefully. The fog coming up. Yeah, I will. Goodbye, my uh, my almost wife. <laughs> Goodbye, my almost husband. Now show them all. What? Yeah, I'll have her if I want. I'll take everything if I want. You can't do it to me. Well, just shut up, Simon. Will you just go back to sleep? Huh? Hey, the VC got a roadblock, Lieutenant. Huh? Yeah, I feel it in my bones, right around the next bend. To stop the convoy. I'm going to stop the... Oh! Steve, where, where are we? All right, all right, take it easy, Simon. We're just on the way home. Huh? How come I'm not driving? Because you passed out. Well, the, the road, where's the road? We're, we're off the road. Cut it out, you fool. It's just far. No, no, off the road. Back, what? back to the left. Look what you like. You don't want to get back to the left. Get a smoke. Go 
After the protesting scream of rubber, the quiet in the forest is a stillness so thick it could almost be touched. A rabbit stands frozen before flight. The birds perch on the limbs, heads cocked, as if waiting to decide which direction danger will come from. The only thing moving now is one of the twins, climbing from the twisted wreck. But which one? I'll return shortly with Act Two. The birds have risen and are off in a whir of wings. The rabbit has long since reached the safety of his warren before Simon Fairley has determined that the blood dripping in his eyes is from a minor gash in the forehead. And the rest of his aches and pains are just contusions and bruises. Only now does he go to look at his brother, pinned between the steering wheel and the seat cushion. Steve? Steve, are you all right? You're not dead. You can't be. Dead. It would solve everything. It would all be mine. And no blame for me. He was driving. Steve. Steve, can you hear me? I... Damn, it's so difficult to get at your heart to hear. I can't feel any pulse. Dead. No more second-class citizen. I'd be number one at last. The house, the money, even... No. No, not Becky. She's beyond me. Unless... I could get away with it. I already did before I got careless and Steve turned up. Yes, that's it. That's the way. Make an exchange. Just get Steve out of his seat into mine. The wheel hasn't got him pinned too tight. No. There. He's coming loose. That's it. It's going to work. It's all going to be mine. Uh, what? What happened? Steve, you're... Uh, you're alive. Uh, yeah, I guess so. How are you? Hey, you're bleeding. Huh? Oh, I just... I, I, I just cut my head a little. It's it's nothing. Uh, oh, I can't get up. I think I sprained my ankle. Maybe broken it. Here, give me a hand, Si. Uh, some sort of jagged rock under my back. Uh, could you move it or or, or help me up? Yeah, let me see. Oh, it's just it's just a rock. Let me get rid of it and then get rid of it or use it. What are you waiting for? I uh, I'm not waiting any longer. Well then, for the love of. Plenty to do before someone finds you. Go around and break the windshield. No, no, not not from the outside. The inside. Now, get Steve into my seat and get into the driver's seat till someone finds me. All right, fellas, finish up with the pitches and then get those two guys free. <laughs> now, don't try to move them. The ambulance will be here any moment. It can... Uh, Come back down there. Okay, miss, nothing for you. Move along. Oh, oh Sergeant, please. You, you've got to let me get through to Stephen. Stephen who? Stephen Fairley. I, I heard about the accident. You know Stephen Fairley? We're going to be married next week. Okay, cut your motor. Come on out. Now, uh, look, Miss... Uh... Uh, Elizabeth Rundell. Oh, sure. I thought I recognized you. Uh... Well, what is it, Sergeant? Can't you take me to the car? Well, he's not badly hurt. Look, he... uh, look, Miss Rundle. Do you happen to know who was driving the car? Well, yes, as a matter of fact, I do. It, it was Stephen. You sure of that? Quite. They'd only just left a, an engagement party at my house, and Simon had had too much to drink, so Stephen took the wheel. They look so like each other, I can't blame you for not... They being... don't look 
nothing like each other now, lady. Well, they're not... Stephen isn't dead. The passenger is dead. The driver is alive. Oh. That's your guy. How bad off he is, we won't know till we get into the hospital. Nurse? No, Steve. It, it's me. It's Becky. Oh, I'm... I'm sorry. Do you want the nurse? No, no. It's, it's just this bandage. It's, it's half over my eyes. <laughs> You'll be able to tell me from Simon from now on easily with this scar I've got over my eyes. Haven't they... Haven't they told you about Simon yet? What do you mean, told me? He wasn't... Oh, my God, now... Now I remember I was... I was half out when they found me, but I... His head must have gone right through the windshield. Is, is he dead? Yes. Oh, that poor, foolish kid. It's all my fault. I should have put the seatbelt oh, on him. Oh, darling, don't blame yourself. Just tell me what happened. It was the damn fog and Simon's drinking. I... I was taking it quite easy, but you know that big hollow on Hillsdale Road shortly after Gray's Corners? Mm -hmm. Well, just just as we hit that, the fog was like a smoke screen. And at the same time, Simon woke up from some drunken dream about Vietnam and went crazy. He grabbed the steering wheel and threw us right off the road and into the tree before I had a chance to break. The wheel and the seatbelt saved me. Although I did take a pretty good crack across the forehead, but Simon... Well, forget about that now, dear. It, it's over and done with. Just let's get you well. Oh, I'm, I'm fine, Becky. I've gotten a clean bill of health. Nothing broken, just a few bruises and a little embroidery above my eyes. You think you can manage a slightly piebald groom with a bandage headband? Oh, now look, Steve. We, we can't have the wedding as we planned it now. Why not? Well, how would it look? I don't care how it looks. It was my father and brother, and there was little love lost among us. I can tell you the truth now, dear. But I, I thought you and your father... My had... father was a hard man. Selfish, domineering, insensitive. He was more like a machine than a man. He was proud of me not because I was his son, but because I was his heir. Something to perpetuate the fairly name. Some sort of pseudo-immortality. Well, I'll make it up. I'll make it up to you. The past, Steve... Our future will be a long and lovely one. Huh. With no twins? Oh, well, I can't promise that. Well, they, they skip generations. Now, look, you you run along and plan something lovely to wear for tonight. Tonight? Yes, darling. I've already arranged the whole thing with Cook and Butler. You and I are having our engagement dinner alone at the house tonight. I'll send Gray with the car to pick you up at 7.30. <laughs> Please forgive me for troubling you with uh, uh, affairs of state, so to speak, the very day you're out of the hospital. That's all right, Mr. Holcomb, but I am a little short of time. Yes, of course, by all means. Now, what I need is a number of signatures from you. Signatures? No, just some legal papers and certain uh, certified checks which can't wait. Damn. Well, look, you'll, you'll have to give me a day or so until they can take the bandage off this right hand of mine. I... I can't sign anything until they do. Oh, my apologies. Of course, I hadn't realized. Of course, everything can be delayed. <laughs> Except for one thing. What? Well, there's a piece of correspondence I don't quite understand. Apparently, some sort of a private deal between you and uh, Pesson, Joe Glue and company. Who? Uh, Peasant Joglu and Company, a Turkish import-export firm with whom we have some dealings. You know, Persian rugs, tabarets, ancient jewelry, inlaid cabinets, silk screens. Object are of many descriptions. Yes. But I don't know what consignment this letter, opened by mistake after your father's death, refers to. Uh, well, damn this forehead bandage. You, uh, read it to me. Oh, yes, very well. <coughs> oh, omitting the formal address. It reads, um, <coughs> Dear Stephanos, we are still awaiting payment consignment YB382-7. We are 
informed that delivery has been received. Unless your check for $48,000 or equivalent uh, reaches us within the week, we will be forced to take action against you. We know this must only be an oversight. Yours sincerely, Demetrius uh, Passon. Uh, uh, Joe. Well, why don't you just pay it? Oh, Mr. Fairley, no one else in the company knows anything about this consignment, except you. Me? Oh, well, of course. Look, it, it's a perfectly normal deal. Just just pay him the money. Oh, a check that size would have to be countersigned by you, sir. And with your hand well, on the Well, by condition... tomorrow, I may be able to manage. Have we Have we time? Oh, according to the letter, to the end of the week or the beginning of next. I don't think it's that important. All the puzzles me is the nature of such a, an expensive secret and, uh, <laughs> shall we say, a, a personal consignment. I don't think I have to account to you for that. Oh, well, not to me, but eventually when the books are... If you must it, know, it was a wedding present for my wife. Wife-to-be, that is. It, uh, it was my father's idea. A, a necklace. Apparently he got sick before he issued the check. Is there any reason why I can't close this matter? Oh, no, 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 not at all. Everything is yours now, Stephen, eh? <laughs> well, now, I, I mustn't delay you. You, you uh, will be postponing the wedding this Saturday, I suppose. No. Well, but there's scarcely time for your brother's funeral. It was Simon's it? desire to be cremated. It's already been done. There will be no funeral. Ah, I see. Perhaps you're right, Stephen. There's been enough sorrow for you in the past few days. You have a right to some happiness. Uh, that briefcase is very heavy. I'll carry it to your car for you. Well, perhaps it's better I leave it here. Then you can sign at your leisure. Good idea. And now, uh... Oh, yes. Now, of course, I must be off. Well, I expect you'll be taking a honeymoon, you and Becky... <laughs> so we won't be seeing you at the office for quite a while. No, not for quite a while. <laughs> uh, here you are, Mr. Holcomb. Let me help you in. Ah, uh, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> now, call me as soon as you're ready with those signatures. The signature. I'd better get up to Steve's room and start learning to copy it. And what's that devil is that business with the two. I've got to get away from here fast. There are too many things I don't know about Steve. Everything's working too well to make any mistakes now. I uh, guess I have time to go through Steve's desk before I have to get dressed. Damn. It's locked. Naturally, Simon. Among your other unpleasant characteristics, you've always been a sneaky little snoop. Steve. Not exactly in the flesh, of course, thanks to you, but Steve, just the same. We're something rather special, you and I. <laughs> Even though you've somewhat altered my appearance, I am still your twin. Only the mouth and the chin and the hair, matted now with dried blood, would serve to identify Steve. The rest of the face is a horror of torn flesh and the white shards of shattered bone, out of which wreckage stares the one uninjured eye, boring with deadly intensity into the terrified face of the man who was once his image. I'll return shortly with Act Three. fear, and fascinated by that single hypnotizing eye, Simon is forced, for what seems an eternity, to focus on his twin's ruined face, the mocking smile, and the white even teeth, a ghastly contrast which multiplies the horror of the broken skull above them. At last, with a supreme effort, he tears his eyes away to find himself staring at the reflection of his own countenance in the mirror above the desk. No. Oh, God, no. Don't cover your face, little brother. Leave me at least with a memory of how I once looked. You're dead. Cremated. You can't be here. As I said, not in the flesh, but uh, we are hatched from the same egg, Simon. You can't get rid of me so easily. I shall always be with you 
uh, in spirit, shall we say? No. No, leave me alone. I will. When it serves me. Or you. Steve, I... I didn't... I didn't mean to... Of course you did. I might possibly have done the same if our positions had been reversed. What? You have a lot to learn about me, little brother. Which you would have in time. <laughs> to avoid breaking open my desk, let me offer you the key. Steve, I, I... I can't rummage through your things now. The key? Take it. Why not? And since time is short before the dinner, I'll even help you understand a little better. Open the desk. Yeah. Left hand pigeonholes are a false front. No, no, here. Let me. There are all my secrets. Now, while you read them, I'll tell you about the most important items. But why, why are you helping me? Because I want you quite as thoroughly damned as I am. I'll make it brief as you read. Now, Demetrios is in the drug business. For years, I have used Father's impeccably accredited import firm to cover for deliveries. You... you in drugs? You'll find the evidence in the papers you're leafing through. <laughs> Wicked Simon, the black sheep. Stupid Simon, really. We were twins in more than the outward look, believe me. The difference was that you didn't have enough sense to bury your faults. I was smart enough to keep them covered up, but not smart enough to realize you had as little scruples as I had when it came to the point. All right, so you lost. Why not let me have my innings now? Why not? I'll even be of help. Until you have studied my signature enough to mask it, I'll even sign your papers for you. <laughs> oh, don't worry. The hand that guides the pen may be of the spirit world, but the pen and ink are finite enough. Go on. Get ready for romance. This... This letter that came from your Demetrius, shall I... Shall I pay this? Uh, let me see. Oh, that double-dealing crook. Nah, no, don't pay him a cent. I've already made arrangements so that he will be paid in full. Yeah, forget it. And you? <laughs> I will not be so easy to forget, dear twin brother. We are bound together by special hoops of steel. As long as I haunt this house, I shall be unavoidably hard to escape. Well, go on. It's time for you to be all that Becky expects of me. Of you. Aren't I what you hope to become? <laughs> It's really too hot for a fire, but I, I couldn't resist it. I'd find it irresistibly romantic, even if I were bathed in sweat, which I'm not. <laughs> can, I, can I make you another drink? No, oh, thank you. I want to enjoy this dinner and remember it. The champagne. I'd be disappointed if there weren't. I don't want ever to disappoint you, darling. Oh, my darling Steve. Not you, ever. <sighs> I'll try to live up to your expectations. Do you love me? I love you. I've always loved you. Now that I came so close to losing you, I love you even more. Oh, it's a terrible thing to say, I know, but... Thank God it was Simon instead of you. Shh, darling, let's not spoil the evening. I've sent all the servants out, you know. We're all alone. You sure you don't want another drink? No. But can I make a confession? Of course. I'm famished. <laughs> Mademoiselle A. <et> Selby. <laughs> May I escort you to your table? Thank you, monsieur. Oh, Stephen. How pretty the table is. My favorite roses. But why... Why what, Becky? Why is it set for... for three? You don't mind my joining you, Simon, do you? Suitably dressed? White tie and tail, and uh, the face mask I thought was a stroke of genius. It hides the damage so nicely. Did you say something, Steve? That damn Joseph, he's in his dotage. I suppose he's so accustomed to setting for three that he just... Don't blame the poor butler. I set the third place. Damn you, I won't have it. There's only... Uh... Steve! Steve, what is it? Uh, 
I'm, I'm sorry, Becky. I, I can't help it. It's all spoiled now. Let, let's get out of here and eat somewhere else. I've got to get away from this house. Sorry, Becky. I, I know it must seem foolish to you, but that extra chair set for our dinner, it, it threw me. Well, it was unfortunate, I know, when you wanted everything to be just right. But don't blame poor old Joseph too much. After all these years of setting the table for you and your father and... and... The... Simon. That's what did it to me, see? I could, I could see him sitting in that chair with his face... You didn't see him after the accident, thank God, but he... Steve, it wasn't your fault. He was the one who grabbed the wheel and pulled you off the road into the tree, wasn't he? Simon. Yes, Simon was, was the one, all right. That's, that's true enough. So you mustn't take the blame. As long as I live in that house, he'll haunt it. The memory of him, the battered face... Well, we'll solve all that. You won't live in the house. You'll move out to a hotel tonight, and after we're married on Saturday, when we come home from the honeymoon, we'll buy a new house. Hey, wait. I I have an even better idea. Maybe we'll never come back. Never? Maybe we'll, we'll settle in, in Rome or Paris or the Costa del Sol. Or, or just travel. I've always wanted to see Mont Saint-Michel and the Tivoli and Taj Mahal. That's my girl. That That's what we'll do. Free souls with never a look behind. Becky... Becky, we've got it made, you and me, from here on in. Off for the honeymoon. Oh, oh, God, you again. Always, always, my dear twin, we're prisoners in the same jail. What does that mean? This house. Oh, I know you think you're escaping it for a while. But that's only temporary. Take it from me. Becky and I are off for a honeymoon. Of course. Not till Saturday, though. Does seem a little early to be packing. Might as well start sometime. And you seem to be planning to take quite a wardrobe. Well, on a ship, there's plenty of room. Plenty of distance between here and there. What do you mean, there? Oh, wherever. What were they, Rome? Paris? Saint-Michel, the Taj Mahal, the very poetic one. Damn you! Do you know everything? One of the few advantages of being a ghost. And you... You can go everywhere? No, there are limitations. No, I'm tied to this house. And you're welcome to it. Thank you, Simon. Or should I call you Stephen? Oh, it's so confusing since you switched identities. Which, by the by, reminds me, while you were dining and making all your escape plans, I signed all the papers old lawyer Holcomb left, so you are free to go. I, uh, I suppose I should say thank you. <laughs> Call it my wedding gift. What, what about the check for that Demetrius or whatever his name was? Oh, forget about that. That was a private deal. He doesn't need your check. Other arrangements have been made to satisfy that debt, believe me. So, this, as the word goes, is goodbye. Yes. I'm sorry I won't be able to attend the wedding and give the bride away. I never intend to come near this house again. Pity. I'm afraid you're going to be disappointed. You like the cabin all right, Becky? Oh, it couldn't be more perfect. How about your new husband? Ditto. Well, just keep feeling that way. <laughs> oh, darling, you, you'll have to excuse me for a minute. Why? Oh, I don't know. The, the assistant purser just told me someone from the office needs an okay or something before we sail. He doesn't have a pass, so they wouldn't let him aboard. I'll be back in ten minutes. What? Well, uh, don't miss getting back on the boat. Don't you worry. It took me long enough to catch it. Mr. Hood? Yeah. You from uh, Fairley Company and Sons? Yeah, right. You uh, Stephen Fairley? Yes. Good. I got a message from you from my boss. Uh, can we step over here to my car? Well, the boat's too near sailing. You just tell me here. At the car. I just play it real cool, Mr. Fairley, and don't make any sudden moves. The jab you feel is the muzzle of a short barrel 38. Okay. Shall we step over to the car? 
Where? Where are you taking me? A little spot on the Jersey Flats. Ain't exactly quicksand, but you'd be surprised how fast that slime sucks up a body that ain't moving. You're... You're not going to kill me. You know, dope is a funny game. Using your business as a front was a great way for us to get the stuff in. But when you try the old double O, Mr. P, oh, that was crazy, Stephen. Now, look, you don't... You don't understand. I'm... I'm not Stephen. What? Stephen is dead. I'm Simon. I had nothing to do with this. Yeah, sure. See, sure. no, look. When we had the automobile accident, all I did was change places. Sure. I mean, Stephen was driving, and I was... Oh, for God's sake, look, I just got married. My wife is... Please, you've got to listen! Okay. Dump him in the swamp, and let's get out of here, Giorgio. <laughs> set for two this time. That's all there is. The rest are gone. Just you and me. Oh, I know how it feels, but you might as well face it. Eternity is such a long time. And since we were twins, it seemed a shame Simon was alive and Stephen dead. This way, I'm still dead. But even Stephen. <laughs> A footnote to the tale you just heard. Mr. Hood's quagmire proved less effective than its reputation, and Simon's body was recovered. Since he had served in the army, an examination of his fingerprints established the deception about the death of the twins. The tangled result of the estate is unimportant since there was no heir. But at least Becky gained a measure of peace in finding out that she had not tied her life to a man who would have ruined it. I'll be back shortly. Whenever the dead try to control the living, the seeds of disaster are sown. At the beginning of our tale, Justine Fairley lay in his bed, whitened with the wax of death, his stubborn mind at peace with the thought that he had settled the future of his twin sons. Sick transit gloria mundi. So passed the triumphs of this world. He could no more control the accident of their birth than he could their deaths. Our cast included Michael Tolan, Paul Hecht, Joan Lovejoy, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time... Pleasant dreams?